Uh, ladies and gentlemen, it's, and it is super to see uh, uh, several female faces here tonight. Uh, welcome to the Swinton Circles Spring Buffet, our annual event. Uh, every year we seem to uh, grow a little bit more, and this year particularly. Uh, I, it's nice to see uh, quite a few old faces and quite a few new faces here this evening. Uh, I'm not going to uh, uh, single out too many people, but uh, I would like to particularly welcome uh, two people. Uh, one is properly uh, uh, here, my longest uh, serving colleague, Neil Farnell, who uh, toured Rhodesia with me in uh, 1976. And uh, so we go back that, uh, that long. Uh, so it is particularly good to see Neil. And secondly, probably the newest uh, contact we've made, which is uh, uh, Paul, Paul from uh, uh, Canada at the back, uh, who only emailed me a couple of days ago, expressed interest, and uh, uh, we've, uh, uh, well, <laughs> even after just two days, he's here. And uh, let me just also uh, throw in a warm wel uh, uh, welcome, as always, to David Wedgwood, who has just turned up. So uh, always good to see you, of course, David. Uh, we are particularly fortunate uh, today to have as our guest speaker one of uh, the country's most renowned barristers, Mr. Michael Shrimpton. Um, but before then, uh, a few little announcements. Uh, first of all, I have got what seems to be a piece of very sad news because we have heard rumour, and so far it is, alas, only rumour, that one of our longest standing supporters, Mr. James Hannett uh, from Northern Ireland, has died. Uh, this has still to be confirmed, uh, so I, I think it, it's a tricky position. I think it will probably be best uh, to wait until uh, our first meeting after this has been definitely confirmed. His great friend, I know, of, my, uh, of our great supporter in Belfast, David Kerr. Uh, and I've been trying to get through to David Kerr for the last um, few days to have this confirmed, but unfortunately I can't. Con I haven't been able to contact him. Um, so, uh, as I say, it, we might have a piece of very sad news, but until it's confirmed, I think we won't ask for a moment's silence for him until then. That is the bad news. Now for the good news. Uh, I think you all, or most of you anyway, uh, remember Craig, Craig Selvage, our uh, supporter from Australia. So, uh, uh, Paul, it's not just uh, Canadians where, where we have our supporters from the Commonwealth. Uh, Craig uh, had to go back to Aussie uh, a couple of years ago, and as most of you probably know, he got married there. And a couple of weeks ago, I received a lovely Facebook message from his wife to say that she was pregnant and that they're going to have their first child uh, it looks like uh, Christmas Eve, so you can't keep the Swinton Circle down. We <laughs> we are growing literally. <laughs> so uh, I I uh, I presume that we can pass on uh, the very best wishes to Craig and his wife Amanda uh, from us all this evening. And uh, uh, let's hope we'll see them. Let's hope we'll see all three of them uh, before too long. Right, uh, they are the uh, preliminary announcements. Michael Shrimpton has spoken for us a couple of times in the past. He spoke at our big Enoch Powell uh, centenary conference dinner in 2012 as one of our four guest speakers. And I feel sure all those who heard him then are looking forward to hearing him again. Um, he, his, uh, uh, speech was so mesmerising that one of our members, uh, Alex Van Tuchek from Bath, uh, had specifically asked uh, to be informed when he was going to come back and tell us about his book, which he spoke briefly about on, on that occasion. Unfortunately, <laughs> Alex is now in South Africa, so uh, and, and he <coughs> is angry because he really wanted to hear you on video. Yeah. But he will be able to see it on video, as you rightly say. Because thanks to, um, uh, and it is 
Uh, Henry. Hugh. You, you. Got the first letter right. Got the first letter right. Can't remember. Hugh, thanks to Hugh, this is going to be recorded, so I can now tell Alex that he can view it online at any time. Michael, I've known for a few years. It's not just politics which we have in common. Uh, he is also a fanatical cricket lover uh, and also a great uh, uh, fan of Bentley cars. Me driving around in my Ford Focus, of course, have no interest in Bentley <laughs> cars, but we are fellow uh, cricket fanatics. And uh, or the, and I still regard him as a friend of those in Middlesex as Walter and I'm, of course, a Kent supporter. Uh, but there is more to Michael than just those two uh, interests. Um, I know uh, I'm I'm reading now, and I shouldn't, but uh, I won't tell to say when you were born because you don't don't look nearly that age. But uh, he is one of the most renowned barristers in in the country. He's often seen on television. Uh, I remember seeing him on Sky uh, a news report just uh, recently. Uh, when uh, he uh, is graduated, the right term he was called to the bar at Gray's Inn in '83, uh, and he has done a number of cases or we've been involved with a number of cases which pleases our patriotic hearts no end uh, particularly defending the metric martyrs and I always, always think they shouldn't be called metric martyrs they should be called imperial martyrs because they stuck up for the imperial measurement yes. not metric. Uh, and, he, oh, yeah. and he also uh, was involved in, with uh, General Pinochet that, that great friend of the United Kingdom from Chile who was wickedly victimised by correct by the Labour government specifically by Jack Straw um, a stain on our national reputation which I think will take some time to eradicate but Michael was one hero uh, who stood up for General Pinochet he has been a representative uh, of uh, he, is, uh, he is a national security uh, consultant, a national security expert, uh, so well regarded that both not only the British uh, security services but also the American and Israeli security services uh, have often consulted him. And he has been on uh, committees regarding uh, the 9 11. Uh, investigations uh, to confirm that uh, what actually happened did actually happen, uh, in spite of all the nutty conspiratorial rumours. Uh, he also joined the uh, presidency of George W. Bush, or number 43, as I think you like to call him, yes. as he was a 43rd president. <laughs> Sidetrack, sidetrack, we had a Springbok Club meeting on Saturday and there was a dispute about whether it was it Cleveland who uh, was president both before and after Harrison. Who was Rare people. Yeah, yeah. Uh, whether it should be 43rd or perhaps 42nd or perhaps 44th. Anyway, I think it's, it's customarily uh, 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 accepted that George W. Bush was uh, 43rd. Uh, Michael was uh, consulted, uh, I don't know what the actual position was, but he was uh, consulted pretty regularly by Vice President Dick Cheney. Oh. So, so uh, we have a man here as our guest speaker tonight who has mixed with the top, who is at the top of his game. It is a great pleasure, it is a great privilege, Michael, uh, to have you as our guest speaker tonight. When he spoke for the Enoch Powell uh, Centenary uh, Conference dinner, he told us all about the book which he was then writing um, which he has now finished. I think he finished. I think he finished part of it whilst watching the uh, England play the Ashes in, in Australia. Didn't he? He was in Australia. Um, the way England played, then I'm not surprised that you uh, took some time out to uh, write a book. Uh, but it has now been finished. There was quite some problem, I know, getting a publisher, which in itself says a lot about how dynamic this book is. They are on sale this evening. They will be autographed. Collector's piece. So it's all over to you. 
So Michael this evening is going to talk mainly about his book, mainly about the contents, to whet your appetites. So without any further ado, Mr. Michael Shrimpton. Thank you. That kind and generous introduction. It's a pleasure to be addressing the Swinton Circle again. You normally do very well to bring me out of my shell, uh, which, uh, of course, I need encouraging, as anybody knows me knows. Uh, a bit of a shy, retiring wallflower it can, can be terribly difficult to get me to say anything, uh, but you normally manage to succeed. Uh, I want to, I'm particularly glad that you mentioned General Pinochet. As I've said in the book, uh, which is up the front here, that's the book that uh, I told you all about two years ago. Uh, General Pinochet, the nicest dictator I've ever met. He was awfully nice, he was awfully nice dictator. The, uh, uh, we don't talk about the coup in Chile, of course, Alan. We talk about the change of government. Coup, coup is such a strong word. Now, I, I'm very glad that we're being videoed this evening. I should tell you a little story. The last meeting I did that was videoed was a briefing to the Marlborough <coughs> Search Group uh, in Marlborough in 2008. And this video was stuck on YouTube and nobody watched it. I think it had about 300 hits in six years. Uh, but in the course of that video, I had just been working on a case which I've covered in Spy Hunter. Um, a very interesting case involving an American politician, uh, to be more precise, a Kenyan politician who ended up as President of the United States, a chap called Obama, <laughs> who may have heard of him. <laughs> and he, uh, and there are a number of Africa hands in the audience who will appreciate that he was born in Mombasa, in what was then the Coastal Protectorate, which was the suzerainty, or was it, the, it was part of the suzerainty of the Sultan of Zanzibar, right. which causes a huge amount of confusion in the States, uh, because I keep telling him that their president was born a subject of his highness, the Sultan of Zanzibar. And I had some idiot of an expert last week telling me, oh no, that can't possibly be right, because Mombasa's not in Zanzibar. Zanzibar's an island. Oh dear, Zanzibar <laughs> was the, 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 Zanzibar was the domain of the Sultan of Zanzibar, the actual island that we all think of Zanzibar isn't Zanzibar anyway, uh, and the coastal protectorate was part of the Sultanate of Zanzibar. Anyway, this little, I've made a few comments because I had just done some advice for the CIA, all from us people, and they'd had me around for lunch at Claridge's. And I know whenever the CIA, don't have that big a budget, whenever the CIA invited you to lunch at Claridge's, I knew it was something big, because normally they take you to McDonald's. <laughs> and uh, it was the CIA after all. <laughs> and so we rolled up the carriages, and the DIA were there as well. There was a half bird colonel of the DIA, the CIA. Of course, of course, the CIA, when they invite you to lunch, I should explain, ladies and gentlemen, the CIA don't send an embossed invitation saying the Central Intelligence Agency would invite you to lunch. Of course, it was a political councillor from the United States Embassy, but we were there with the half bird intelligence colonel. We were discussing intelligence matters. It was clearly the CIA. And uh, the lunch was all about Obama. A couple of years before, the word had got round that I had given some advice to those very nice people, MI5. Uh, I won't give names because we're being recorded, but there was a British politician and a baby turned up unexpectedly. And there was an issue, it was a Labour politician, but I won't give names. Uh, there was a baby turned up unexpectedly and there was an issue about who the father was. And MI5 were interested to know because they, they want a bit of extra, you know, a bit of extra in the budget. They want a bit of leverage over down in, uh, over, 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 over the Labour government. And uh, they were being threatened with cuts and various other bits of nonsense. And I said, look, it's easy. We just do a DNA test. And they said, Michael, how do we do a DNA test on a member of the government? <laughs> I said, well, that's easy. You just get DNA from the baby. And I, they seem to have some thought that you know, they'd have to go into a government department with a bloody great needle extracting stuff from the baby. And I said, no, you can't have that. I mean, that's not going to work, is it? The baby will start screaming. Somebody will come in. And then you've got an MI5 officer with a bloody great syringe <laughs> for the, the trying to extract blood from a baby. I said, forget it. That won't work. All you just do is wipe. DNA off the baby, and the baby's triple DNA all day long. And uh, as for the other, uh, uh, the, there was the, a father, uh, <laughs> and the person we thought was the father, and the mother, and I said, look, it's simple. All you do is arrange a dinner. And at the dinner, you get their wine glasses, because you'll have fingerprints on the glass, and you'll have saliva. And the saliva will give you DNA. And the test was done, and 
the, the, the real father turned out to be somebody different, and MI5's budget, <laughs> MI5 budget went up by about 25%, <laughs> and Michael had friends in MI5 I didn't have before, which is why I felt able to call on the boys for the occasional favour, not that they ever actually paid me anything, they never get paid for these things. Uh, they never, you never get, you don't get a thank you, if you do something for MI5, you don't get a letter saying thank people. <laughs> but I did actually have a couple of letters from MI5, very anodyne, just saying thank you for your information. Uh, but the MI5 don't normally write to you. And should an issue arise as to whether you've actually been in discussion with MI5, it's extremely helpful, Mr. Chairman, to be able to, to pull out a briefcase, <laughs> some headed note paper from the security service with their, with their motto on, Regnum Defende, uh, addressed to you at your genuine address. And that shuts people up no end, including Thames Valley Police. <laughs> uh, query. Once had the gall to query whether I've any communication with MI5. I said, well, how do you explain these letters? The CIA were interested in this particular way of uh, establishing paternity, and an issue had arisen as to whether Obama's mother was his mother. It was not a real problem with the father then. There is now, but there wasn't then. Uh, and I explained how we'd done it with MI5, and they thought, that's very good, and they went away and organised a little test. And it turned out that Obama was not related to his grandmother, which meant he wasn't related to his mother, which meant he wasn't born in Honolulu, which meant he couldn't be president of the United States under the US Constitution, because you have to be a natural born citizen. So A, he wasn't a citizen at all, and B, he wasn't born in Honolulu. Uh, problems for Obama. Now, the CIA ratted on me, uh, and they cut their own deal. So they went to Obama and they cut a deal. And I had briefed in uh, Bill Clinton. Uh, I didn't brief in Bill, Bill and I've never spoken, but I've got a hold of these people in Washington. I said, look, uh, I'm amazed that you haven't picked up this point on Obama. You do realize he's not actually eligible. And Bill apparently spoke to Kofi Annan. Kofi Annan verified it, because all the Kenya, all the African hands know that Obama was born in Mombasa. It was an open secret in Africa. There's only the Americans who didn't know, but everybody in Africa knew. And uh, Bill then decided to keep quiet, and he held out on Hillary. And I was watching this campaign in 2008, and I thought, well, what's, what's Hillary doing? Why isn't she mentioning this? So I got hold of Hillary's people. Now, they couldn't believe in Bill Clinton's camp that I could get hold of Hillary. Because I'm a bit right wing, as you know, marginally to the right of centre. And Hillary was a bit left wing, and I'm a conservative, and she was a Democrat, and they thought, how on earth would Biden get hold of Hillary Clinton? It was straightforward. She had a lady friend, and she had a, a, a friend in Miami, Miami who was gay, who was an old friend of mine, who was ex CIA. Um, and I simply rang my friend in Miami and said, Can you get through to? It was actually Lauderdale by the sea, a very posh part, very posh part of Florida. And I rang my friend in Lauderdale by the sea, who sat in there along with us, and said, Look, I need to get through to Hillary. Can you do it? He said, No, no problem at all. Uh, I'll just pass it on to X and we'll go to Washington. It did. Then Hillary and Bill had a falling out, and Bill went to the West Coast. He was sent away to campaign for about three weeks in Arizona. Places like Truth and Consequences, New Mexico. <laughs> okay, right. Hillary's now found out. Uh, and this had all happened. And I just mentioned this as an aside. Uh, you know how difficult it is to get me out of my shell, but they managed to, to tempt me into saying something about this thing I've been working on that week. And this was March 2008. Wow. And this video had sat unnoticed on YouTube for about six years. And then there's been a, a bust up with the CIA and Obama in the last couple of months and with the National Security Agency. And two months ago, somebody in CIA dropped my video from the Marlborough Research Group, and that one of our big friends here tonight was there then, dropped this video around to a website not unconnected with the CIA, and all of a sudden it went viral. They got two million hits a day. <laughs> about 10 million people have seen this video. So I'm very pleased that this is being videoed, and you never know. It might be seen by five people, it might be seen by 10 million. <laughs> I'm so now we'll flying to New York. Smile. <laughs> I'm flying to New York next month to give expert evidence. I have to explain to American judges that uh, the president, I'm afraid, uh, isn't entitled to be president because he wasn't actually born in the United States. He was born in Mombasa. And I'm going to have to explain where Zanzibar is and, and, and who the Sultan of Zanzibar was. Now, the book itself uh, is divided into three parts. 
The first part is the boring bit, and that's about me. It, it's a semi, it's an autobiography. I call it a potted autobiography. The idea of that was simply to explain to people who I am, because I'm very shy retiring and not a public figure. And, you know, people need to know <coughs> how on earth do I know the stuff that's in parts two and three. So part one, I thought, was essential to have a coherent uh, book. Uh, but that's the boring bit, uh, and I'm not going to tell you about me. Uh, you can read about it if you want. Uh, but that's the, that's the boring bit. Part two is a less boring bit, and that covers the secret history of German intelligence in the run-up to uh, the creation of the DVD in 1945. So that covers the history from the formation of Germany up until 1945, includes World War I, World War II. That's part two. And then part three is the really exciting bit, the juicy bit, and that is all about the Deutsche Verteidigungsdienst, which is the covert service set up by Admiral Canaris, the head of German intelligence in World War II. He survived. He cut a deal with Heinrich Himmler, now, I happen to know the intelligence officer, who is British, uh, who uh, rolled up to see Heinrich Himmler after he surrendered to us in the hopes of cutting a deal. Heinrich had cut a deal with Canaris, and Wilhelm had agreed to use his British connections, which included Mingis, the head of MI6. And the deal was that Heinrich would arrange for a fake execution of Canaris, uh, allowing Canaris to disappear from sight. In exchange, Canaris agreed that uh, Heinrich would be sur would surrender to the British and he would be allowed to live, that we would look after him. And this deal was struck with Mingis, the head of MI6, who reported to Canaris. He was a German spy. Unfortunately for Heinrich, Wilhelm ratted on the deal. And someone I know, a British intelligence officer now obviously long retired and well into his 90s, who happened to have met Adolf Hitler before World War II, rolled up <coughs> and gave Heinrich Himmler back his suicide pill. <laughs> <laughs> to be more precise, I, I mean, the whole area is very delicate. He won't actually tell me what he did with the suicide pill. I have a shrewd suspicion, Mr. Chairman, that he actually rammed it down Heinrich's throat because <laughs> Heinrich wasn't that keen on topping himself. Uh, but that <coughs> is the background to the creation of the Deutsche Verteidigungsdienst, the German Defense Service. And part three tells you all about the German spies. It covers the Kennedy assassination. It covers the Diana assassination, the Kelly assassination, a whole bunch of stuff they've got up to uh, since 1945, including the creation of the European Union, rigging the 1975 referendum, and so on. Now, I thought that uh, rather than, because the book covers a great deal of territory, it's 700 pages long, rather than bore you to tears by going through everything, I just thought I'd pick out a few highlights from different eras. Uh, and. Uh, uh, give you a bit of a flavour as to what the book is all about. And the first thought I, the first thing I'm going to light on is the Black Death. Now, uh, my publisher, Keith Carson, very, very courageous man, <laughs> June Press, wonderful publishers, uh, very good people. All man. Exactly. <laughs> Mrs. Not, Keith and not all in, man. Not all <clears throat> In my introduction, because I gave just a little bit of an historical introduction. And I said, well, the Black Death, <coughs> which everybody thinks was uh, uh, a naturally occurring event, was in fact organized. And it's all to do with deep Vatican politics. And uh, the, the Black Death was spread deliberately. It was nothing to do with rats. And Keith will recall being a little bit nervous about this, as any publisher would be, saying, well, this is a bit avant-garde. This is a bit out of the <laughs> box thinking. Are we sure you want to go with it? And I said, absolutely. <laughs> One of the problems of being an out-of-the-box thinker is that everybody will accuse you of being a nutter or drunk or... Uh, it, 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 Galileo had the same problem when he said that Earth went round the sun. Uh, if you say something that is out of the box, that is contrary to accepted thinking, then of course people are going to query it and they're going to jump up and down and they're going to be upset. Usually because they don't like what you said which is a different thing from whether or not what you have said is right. The Pope didn't like the fact that the Earth went round the sun, but that really didn't matter. The issue is not whether he liked it or not. The issue is whether we actually went round the sun or the other way around. Now, on the Black Death, I knew perfectly well that the Black Death had been spread deliberately. It was a campaign of biological warfare. Now, that involved a conclusion that biological warfare was understood in the Middle Ages. Uh, uh, that somebody, somewhere, had a much more advanced understanding of uh, biological warfare than we thought they did. Well, so be it. Those are the facts. So I stuck to my guns. And I'm right. 
And uh, only a couple of weeks ago, public research was finally published. Somebody's picked up on the work I've done on the Black Death, because it's been around. There was a nutter called Mike Smith, you may remember, threw himself off a church tower. Yes. Not, not before long. No, I mean, he, he, he threw himself off a Porchester Castle. Porchester Castle. He ought to throw himself off a bridge or a castle many years before. My favourite castle now, these <laughs> things. He, he was probably reporting to the German operation in London, GO2, and he used to have, he had a go at uh, your chairman, he had a go at me. And he would take things that I had said and he would put fake postings on the internet or he would take conclusions of mine and then twist them around. Uh, he was quite malicious, reeked of malice, poor chairman. Um, that's probably why he did himself in. I, I probably had internal conflicts about the sort of nonsense he was getting up to. But he used to have a right go at me because my opinions on the Black Death and the Irish uh, potato famine have been in the public domain for some years. Well, people have picked up on the research and somebody has finally checked. The theory was that the Black Death was spread by rats. And I, as I pointed out in the book, well, well, there are two problems with this. One is that rats don't actually travel very far. I mean, your average rat doesn't go from Paris to London. I mean, they might get on ships, but your average rat you know, is not terribly peripatetic. Uh, and the second problem is, if you ever know anything about the bubonic plague, uh, and I did once as an immigration judge deal with a case where somebody had come down with a touch of the bubonic plague from India. I think I wrote in the decision he'd come down with a touch of the bubonic plague, poor chap. Uh, one of the things that you don't do when you have bubonic plague is travel. It's not very comfortable. <laughs> I mean, you don't last very long anyway. It's one of the reasons why it was clear to me that the Black Death was spread deliberately, because most biological weapons are inefficient. The reason they're inefficient is because if it's lethal, it will kill the host very quickly. The problem comes that the host dies so quickly they can't spread it. Actually, very, very unlikely if you think about it. You come down with a black death, you're in the Middle Ages, what do you do? Oh, I'll go and see the relatives in York. <laughs> I'll take a three-day journey over roads even rougher than the M1 and we'll go off to York. <laughs> Absolute nonsense. You wouldn't want to get on a cart and the relatives wouldn't want to see you anyway. <coughs> and finally, somebody's done some research. And we've come up, there's a huge problem with the official explanation. There are no rats. If there was a huge number of rats in the Middle Ages, what we'd have is rat skeletons everywhere. But there aren't any rat skeletons. There are not enough rat skeletons to justify the uh, conclusion that the bubonic plague was spread by rats. And the researcher then retreated, as people <coughs> often do. They didn't like the conclusion. So they retreated and said, oh, probably it wasn't bubonic plague. Well, it was bubonic plague. Well, there's, there's just one area where I've said something which is out on a limb, but subsequent researchers uh, proved it to be uh, correct. If the plague had been spread by rats, we would want rats. Not enough rats, therefore not spread by rats. Therefore, probably spread uh, deliberately. Moving on to the 19th century, many of you will recall the case of Jack the Ripper. Now, Jack the Ripper, absolutely hilarious. Uh, the official explanation is that there was one criminal who was in two different places on one night, who was going around knocking off prostitutes in the East End of London, but he wasn't tying them down. Now, as I explained in the book, if, and I've encouraged people not to try this at home, but if you try and disembowel somebody whilst they're still alive, normally they will protest. It's a natural reaction. You know, you know if you're disemboweling, you're, you're sort of getting people's internal organs, and you, people normally do not like having their internal organs removed. It's just a natural human thing. People get upset if you try and remove their internal organs. And if you're going to remove somebody's internal organs, normally you ought to tie them up first. But there are no evidence of ligatures on any of these women. What's more, there was no evidence of them being gagged. Well, another thing that people tend to do if their internal organs are being removed without anaesthetic whilst they're still alive is they tend to protest. Very often they will scream <laughs> quite loudly. And again, don't try this at home, but take it from me. If your internal organs are being removed, it's a bit painful. One of the first things you're going to do is scream and say, you bastard, stop taking my liver out. <laughs> now, there's no evidence of noise. These women weren't screaming, and I pointed out in the book, this explanation is all absolute nonsense. Clearly it was more than one person. As I've said in the book, in fact, it was the Jeffreys. In fact, it was a German death squad, and the reason the, 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 uh, the person removing the internal organs knew what to remove uh, and how to remove them was because he was a military surgeon. 
Uh, what we have, in fact, is a German death squad with a military surgeon going round East London, um, knocking off prostitutes. And I've explained why. Why would the Jerry's in the 19th century want to run around London and knock you off a load of prostitutes? Because the key German spy in London at that time was a liberal called Gladstone. You may have heard of him. He's the guy who sold uh, Gordon down the river in Part 2, sold him right down the River Nile, as far as the bloody cataracts. Correct. Now, Gladstone was working for the Jerry's. Uh, he was being blackmailed, in part, over his slightly avaricious sexual desires, which were a little bit exotic for Mrs. Gladstone. <laughs> <laughs> Officially, he'd been, he was a friend of prostitutes. He'd been running around the East End of London being kind to fallen women. Well, that's a load of nonsense. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> if you believe that, you believe the Liberal Democrats' last election manifest. <laughs> I mean, no offence, but Gladstone, Gladstone is no more reliable uh, an historian than, uh, than uh, Nick Clegg. <laughs> now, the Jerry's, what had happened was that one of the uh, prostitutes that Gladstone uh, had murdered had a friend, and it looks called Polly, and I think it looks as though, there's some uncertainty, but it looks as though she went to the press, not understanding the editor of the Times, was also reporting to the Germans. Uh, word got back to the German station in London, which is very powerful, and controlled the government, because they controlled Gladstone, uh, that uh, at least one prostitute was talking. So the uh, Jack the Ripper operation had a serious intelligence purpose, which was to deter prostitutes uh, from shopping Gladstone, who left a number of them to die on the streets of London. Very nasty individual, uh, a very violent man, um, and uh, we had dead prostitutes turning up all over the place. Uh, the reason the investigation was a farce is because the government didn't want to find out <laughs> who was responsible, because the Tory Home Secretary was in the loop as well. Uh, the whole thing was covered up. Uh, and for 125 years, we've been treated to absolute nonsense about one man going around disemboweling women whilst they're alive without any help, <laughs> without tying them up in the first place. It's complete and utter nonsense exposed in Spy Hunter for the first time. I think we're beginning to get a, a measure of the book, ladies and gentlemen. It, it is a little bit controversial. <laughs> and something, <laughs> not that I indulge in controversy for its own <laughs> sake, but some of the things it says are new. Well, that's the whole point of writing. That's why I wrote it. <laughs> it's not new. <laughs> why, why, why bother recycling rubbish that people have written before? Spy Hunter says things which are new. The point is that they are also correct. No single conclusion of mine has actually been challenged by any government or intelligence agency, even though my flat was raided, the book was seized, uh, the Cabinet Office had a copy two years ago, desperately tried to find a ground for suppressing publication. I said it in my book. My policy is one of compliance with the Official Secrets Act. One of the problems with the Official Secrets Act is it only covers official secrets. Uh, many secrets, <laughs> many secrets are unofficial. <laughs> the fact that Gladstone was a violent sexual criminal who was being blackmailed by the Germans is a secret, but it's not an official secret because officially he wasn't. <laughs> some secrets, as yes, Minister, you all recall the episode. Some things can be officially unofficial, but yeah. unofficially official. Yeah. So there's no breach of the Official Secrets Act. Governments and intelligence agencies have been pouring over spy hunter for about two years. Uh, you know, drafts have been seen from the very first time it went to a, f to a publisher in email format. Uh, intelligence agencies have been reading it. Uh, uh, nobody has come back and actually challenged a single major conclusion in the book. The only complaint is about the typos. Well, of course, there are typos. <laughs> Unfortunately, the first publisher was American. We had to translate it into American. And then I had to translate it back to English. Uh, for June Press, so uh, that has led, I'm afraid, to one or two typos, but uh, uh, we're working on those. Now, uh, that's Jack the Ripper, I mean, very, very entertaining, uh, unless you're a liberal. <laughs> but I'm afraid if your hero turns out to be a violent sexual criminal, your hero turns out to be a violent sexual criminal. Uh, you know, uh, fans of Rolf Harris have had the same problem, the difference being that Rolf Harris is innocent, unlike, unlike, uh, unlike uh, uh, dear old Gladstone. Uh, it's unusual, I know, for a barrister to comment on a case that's going through the courts, but that case is absolute nonsense, absolute farce, and uh, frankly, what it's doing in the Crown Court, I have no idea. Uh, I'm sure the jury won't get to read this on you, watch this on YouTube, but, but uh, that is a distraction exercise. The problem there is the Cabinet Office were running a paedophile ring uh, that was being administered by Jimmy Savile, and the Cabinet Office are frantic that people find out about their connection to Jimmy Savile. 
And so this whole Operation Utrea is a complete distraction exercise. They've been yeah. running around arresting every Australian entertainer. Anybody with a woogie board, anybody who's sung Tyree Kangaroo down sport uh, is getting arrested and charged with offences, that, you know, complaints that go back 40 years. It doesn't take you 40 years to work out that you've been assaulted or not. Yeah. I mean, most women, if they've been indecently assaulted, no, no, it just take you 30 years to find out. Case of Rolf Harris, uh, you know, it doesn't appear that he was even in the building when these alleged assaults took place because nobody can find any evidence that he actually appeared on that occasion. And this is, this is absolutely wrong. There ought to be a statute of limitations, I suggest six years or three years of majority, uh, and there was three years after you turned 18, six years in total. Uh, for sexual offences, and there ought to be a legal requirement for cooperation. This, mm. these, these prosecutions are an absolute farce, uh, yeah, and I'm confident true. that Rolf Harris will be acquitted. Now, as I say, it's unusual for Ashton to comment on the case which is going through the courts, but I'm prepared to do so, uh, because I think the prosecution is morally wrong uh, and legally unacceptable. There's a lot of newspapers that you can come in. And, uh, well, exactly. As, as it happens, I rather like Rolf Harris. We did we leave once a water nice chap. Now, that's, that's, uh, that's uh, Jack the River. Uh, Dr. Crippin. <laughs> This is another hilarious case. Uh, the official version of events is that Dr. Cribben was hanged correctly for murdering his wife. There are two problems with the official version of events, as I explained in Spy Hunter. The first problem is that his wife was alive uh, when he was hanged. <laughs> normally, normally, if you're defending a murder case, it's normally a very good strategy to be able to call the victim and say, well, but my next witness is Mrs. Crippen. <coughs> well, hang on, your client, Mr. Shrimpton, is accused of murdering Mrs. Crippen. I said, yes, my lad, uh, but he's innocent. And the fact that I'm able to call the person he's alleged to have murdered uh, will, I'm sure, go some way towards proving his innocence. <coughs> at which point the judge will glare at the prosecution. Take it from me. If you're prosecuting a murder, the last thing you want is a defence calling the victims. <laughs> The judge will go spare, he'll start chucking his archbold at you, he will get very upset, the jury will look strangely at you, and the CPS will do their nut. <laughs> now, we knew that Mrs. Crippen was alive, she was in the United States, she'd been traced by Pinkertons, who were in fact an internal intelligence agency, masquerading as a detective agency, it's a bit like, it's a bit like Magnum in, 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 in Hawaii on the TV yes. show. Uh, yes. The... Uh, Mrs. Crippen was not only alive, she'd been traced by Pinkertons, and her name appeared on a shipping manifest 